Welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast presented by Fishhawk Electronics. If you're looking for news, tips, and stories about fishing the Great Lakes, you've come to the right place. And now your host, Chris Larson. Welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. Joining us now is Charter Captain Barb Carey from Wisconsin Women Fish and the Women Ice Angler Project. Barb, thanks for joining the show. Hey, thanks for asking me. Yeah, I wanted to have you on today on the show to talk about fishing the Great Lakes with a smaller boat. When I say small boat, I mean a boat in that 20 foot and under range, something you could potentially see fishing a 200 acre lake over the weekend. Um, tell us a little bit about the boat that you're fishing Lake Michigan with. Well, I'm currently running a um, Crestliner Raptor, and it's an 1850. I have a 150 horse Mercury motor on it um, with an Encoda trolling motor. I, on this boat, I don't even have a ticker motor. And um, this boat has been great out on Lake Michigan. And I tell you, I've learned so much in the last few years, and there's many times out there when the small boats have the advantage. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. What are some of the advantages out of fishing out of a boat like yours compared to what you see a lot of the charters running when they're running 35-foot cabin cruisers? What are some of the advantages of the boat that you're running when you're out on Lake Michigan? Well, I think uh, one of the big things is fuel economy and um, how fast you can run. So, for example, if I get out there in the morning and it, the seas are calm, and I know there's a good offshore shore rainbow trout bite. I can zip out 11 miles out, use hardly any gas, and um, be on those fish really quickly. Um, the trigger boats of that size generally run a lot slower. And they're trying to book in like two to three trips a day. So they don't have the time to spend that much time traveling that far out on like a half day trip or just a morning trip. And they're going through a lot of fuel. So that really kind of cuts into the profits. But with these small boats, I can zip out there, get out there really quick. If the weather starts getting bad, I can get in really quickly. And uh, it just seems to work great. What are some of the disadvantages to having that smaller boat compared to the bigger boat? Why do those, why do those uh, charter captains have the bigger boats? What, do, what are they seeking out with those bigger boats compared to what you have? Well, for one thing, they can take six passengers. And um, even though I'm legally allowed to take six passengers, it's just too crowded in a smaller boat. Um, I like having, you know, two customers at the most. But I'm my goal is to teach them how to take their boat out. So I'm kind of in a different um, realm than the charter boats are. The charter boats, that they can run more lines with those bigger boats. You know, some of them are running 12 to 14 lines. I'll run nine lines out of my boat and not have a lot of headaches with that. And uh, But I'm going to be teaching my clients how to, set, how to run their boats if they want to take their boats out there. So it's more of an educational trip. Um, obviously, we want to be catching fish. A lot of those charters, you know, the people are just pretty much reeling in the fish. And the, the captains of those boats, their goal is to get as many fish in the boat for those clients as they can. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that, Barb. What are the people who are coming to use you um, and, and use your charter and get out on the water with you? What are some of the things that, that they're seeing right away when they get out on the boat with you and, and kind of how you run things? Well, I think, uh, you know, when my boat's parked next to these big boats, I mean, I hear a lot of comments like, oh, my gosh, they're going out in that small boat. And uh, once they once we get out there, they realize how well that boat does. Um, one thing I'll say with this Crestliner Raptor, you know, it's the way that cuts through the water, we're not getting pounded in waves at all. You know, the disadvantages, if the waves get too big, I stay home, you know, I'm not going to that, risk that bad weather getting too big where the charter boats can kind of stay out longer. They can go in bigger waves just because the boats are bigger and they're better able to handle that. I'm not going to push my luck and get out there and get beat up by these big waves just to prove a point. So I have probably less days I'm able to go than the big boats. But when I do go, it's surprisingly comfortable. 
You know, we're not getting back around at all. Mm -hmm. and, and let's talk a little bit about how you've got the thing set up in the boat. Uh, you said you're running about nine lines. What does that setup look like? Well, these are some of the tweaks I've made over the years of doing it. You know, I run all the lines in the back of the boat. So on each side, I have like a three rod holder tree that's attached to the downrigger plate that mounts right to the boat. And this is really easy to take on and off. So the morning I'm going to go, I just put these downrigger brackets on that are attached to these three rod trees on each side. Then for my next um, rod holders, I'll have um, these Canon dual access rod holders, which are really um, stiff. You know, those are great rods for running the wire diver rods, which are my favorites. But there's a lot of torque on those. And that one's just mounted right on a permanently attached track on the gunnel of the boat. And then I'll have two downriggers on uh, both sides. So one of the things that people get mixed up about or are a little confused about with Great Lakes fishing is they think that you're fishing in like really, really deep water. And we may be fishing in 300 feet of water, but a lot of those lines are in the top 25 feet of the water column. So, you know, some of the best rods this spring have just been with an one ounce inline weight in a spoon. You know, you run that with a planer board far away from the boat and the rainbow trout are just going crazy on those. So you're running the you're running the uh, the downriggers. You're running planer boards out the side. What else are you running on on some of your other rods? Yep, the far outside ones. You know, I'll either do a one one ounce inline or like a two color three color lead core. I kind of vary different lengths of lead core. Then I have a um, new to my arsenal this year. I got a 250 weighted wire. It's kind of like copper, only it doesn't get coily like copper does. You know, it lays down nice on the bowl. It doesn't, you don't get that kunkum in it like you do with copper. And so that's, a, I have a 250 weighted wire. And then I have um, two wire diver rods. So this is a non sinking wire line that you hook a dipsy to and then run that down at, you know, and those run off to the side of the bowl. I usually keep them at a two setting. So there's, those are going to be off to the side. And one of the most important things that new trollers have to remember is the lines on the far outside of the boat run highest in the water column. And as you get closer to the boat with the lines, those run deeper. So if you have a, a fish on one of the outside lines, you should be able to get that fish in without crossing over any of those other lines that are in the water because it'll be running on top of them. Yeah, that's always something for people who uh, haven't been trolling or astounded when they see that. <laughs> like, how do you reel something in and, and uh, not get tangled up into everything? And, of course, sometimes that does happen. One, one of the things that really helps prevent those tangles is, you know, the planer boards, the only thing planer boards do is get the line away from the boat. So they're gonna, it's going to kind of work that line way away from the boat. So what happens is there's a release that you can add to the front of that board called a SAMS Pro Release. And that will release the front line when you get a fish on. And then that stops that action of pulling it away from the boat. So then that line will kind of fall right to the center in the back. So when you're reeling in that fish, it's coming straight up behind the motor. So there's no line directly right behind the motor. So that's kind of the corridor that we look for to reel in the fish and to net it right over the where the motor is, basically. Barb, you talked about, speaking of motors, you said you don't have a kicker on your boat. You're running your, your bow mount troller. Um, tell us about that decision and kind of how that setup works. Basically what, you know, the reason I didn't get a kicker was just I had a budget. You know, and adding a kicker put me over the budget and something had to give. And I didn't really want to go down in horsepower on the big motor. I mean, I'm not maxed out on that, but I find that the 150 motor, I have a Mercury 4 stroke 150, and I added an RPM adjustment on there. So I have a little toggle switch right on the console there. So if I'm trolling, say at 2.8 miles an hour, and I want to slow that 
motor down, I can just hit RPM down, and then that's going to drop that speed by real small increments. So I do a lot of my trolling with my big motor. I've had kicker motors in the past, and I just didn't feel that I used them as much as I should, and I relied on the big motor. Those new four-stroke motors will troll so nicely. You know, they're running in the boat. You don't, you don't even know the motor's running because they're so quiet. And you could tweak that RPM adjustment to really dial in on the speed that you want. Now, sometimes I'll run the bow mount, you know, at a setting just to help with steering, you know, and put a, you know, a north heading or a certain bearing heading on the troll mo trolling motor so it keeps the bolt going in the path that I want to. And then just having a little more oomph from the main motor assisting that as it goes with a lower RPM. We've talked about motors now. We've talked about kind of your fishing setup, but... What else is on your boat, maybe like safety equipment, these types of things that you'll find on your boat that maybe somebody that just fishes a 200-acre lake on the weekend won't have on their boat? What are some things that people need to, to add to their boat before they head out on the big water? Well, one of the things I have is a handheld marine radio, and uh, that's really helpful, you know, and I keep that, you know, scanning to make sure that, you know, there's nothing going on that I need to be aware of. I have uh, flares, and one thing about flares, you know, you buy these in a package of three or four in the package, but there's an expiration date on them, and it's not that far out. I mean, I think it's only a couple of years out. So at the beginning of the season, you got to check the dirt on those flares because that's one of the things you get a citation from from the Coast Guard if your flares are expired. Um, I have another, um, you know, an audio device, like a horn, a whistle, an air horn. I got the flares. But one of the things that I started carrying this year is my nebulous. Now, this is something that I use for ice fishing, and it's attached to my snowmobile or my ATV. And if I go to the ice, I pull a cord, and it makes a small life raft that can carry three people. Well, I decided to put this in my boat this year because I've heard stories, you know, where boats start taking on water or something happens and the boat starts sinking. And I already have this device that I use all winter. So I thought it'd be a great idea to keep it in the boat. It doesn't take up a lot of room. If I get in trouble, here I have my own little dinghy with me that I can deploy, call the Coast Guard, but at least we're floating in a, in a portable vessel, you know, if something tragic was happening. Yeah, it's cool to have that kind of with you and it doesn't take up a lot of space and it's something that can really help you if you're in a jam. It's one of those things that uh, you don't want to have to use, but if you have to use, it's great to have it. And, and you kind of went over some of those things there, but if someone wanted to set up their bass fishing boat or their walleye boat for the Great Lakes, what are the first steps? What are some things that they need to kind of look at before they they get going? Well, there are um, Coast Guard regulations for any boat over 16 feet that you're required to have these equipment, or this equipment in your boat. So it's not an optional extra safety thing. It is required. So be sure to review what those are. That's the sound producing device, you know, the visual device. I mean, you're going to have all those tools in place. You have to have your cushion out and available. Um, you have to have white jackets, of course. And it's really, you know, this is where, you know, I see people out there all the time in small boats, much smaller boats than I am, you know, and there's some decent sized waves and these guys aren't wearing their life jackets. And I think that's just crazy. You know, invest in a life jacket that's comfortable, that you don't mind wearing, and just decide to wear it. Make it a rule in your boat that, hey, if you're fishing with me in my boat, I'm you're wearing your life jacket because a few times something has, like a cooler lid of mine once blew out of the boat. Well, that thing was so far away so quickly, you know, and you just can't turn around on a dime when you're pulling nine lines because when you're pulling cables and weighted wire and all this stuff, all of a sudden the danger of getting somebody caught up in that stuff that you're pulling behind to go back and go get them, that's a real danger. So, you know, have buying time to be
be able to get that person back in the boat is so important. No one is ever allowed in my boat fishing without a life jacket on, period. Barb, is there anything about fishing small boat, and I'm sure we could talk about this for hours and hours, but if there, is there anything that, that you want to bring up today that I didn't ask you about? Well, one big safety thing is um, a lot of times in the summer, you know, it's really hot. You go out in the lake, the water's cold, and, and a fog develops. And a lot of times people are, you know, fishing out in this fog. Well, the, the law is that you have to produce an, a prolonged blast of your horn like every three minutes. And a lot of these recreational anglers that are out there trying their hand uh, at this, they're not doing that. They're not aware of that law. So all of a sudden, out of the fog comes this boat headed right for you. You know, you're both pulling a bunch of lines, and it's a real safety hazard. You know, they're going too fast in the fog, for one thing, and they're not producing any audible noise. So if you hear somebody blowing their horn, and then you blow your horn back, you get a bearing of which way that other boat is moving so then in a couple minutes if they blow it again now you can tell if they're coming towards you or going away from you and that's one of the things that these new people taking their small boats out don't know the rules of the road as far as that goes the other big piece of advice is stay away from the charter boats everyone tries to follow the charter boats all over the place thinking that they know where the fish is and it's just making fishing bad for everyone Get away from the crowd. You do not have to fish right by where the other boats are. All it does is spook the fish away and everybody scared, everyone catches less fish. So stop at the boot shop. They'll give you a starting point from a depth standpoint. Yeah, they're getting in about 120 feet. You know, you get out there, you start setting up at 80, 90 feet. You keep trolling generally, you know, west to east out of the uh, other side of the lake. And once you start hitting the fish, then you kind of work that contour and start going north and south. So, you know, that, that's one of the things I saw last time I was out. There was so many small boats out now because it's becoming increasingly popular. And they're just surrounding the charter boats, which, is, which isn't good for anybody. It's good stuff, Barb. And what I like about what you do and kind of what your whole thing is all about is is helping people learn how to do these things. And so if people want to learn more about you and where, where they can get in touch with you, how do they do it? Well, I have a Captain Barb Carey page on Facebook, and we do post some videos on there once in a while. And, you know, I love giving information. People message me all the time. I'm an open book. It's, I don't think anything should be a secret. If you want to put the effort to get out there and give it a try, I'll do what I can to help you. Um, so that's the big thing. If women want to get involved, we have this fishing club called Wisconsin Women Fish, and there are women that never dreamed they would own a boat, and now they have a boat, they're out on Green Bay trolling for walleye, they're trying their hand at salmon fishing, they're launching and loading their boats and going all over the place with a whole bunch of support from these other women and other instructors in the group. So um, it's a great way to kind of gain confidence, increase your skills, and just have a life more full of adventure. There's nothing better, especially in these times of COVID, you know, being out with you and your best buddy in the boat and not having any other people around and just having a glorious afternoon on the water. There's nothing better than that. Thanks, Barb. Really appreciate you coming on and good luck on the water the rest of the year. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast presented by Fishhawk Electronics. For more information on fishing the Great Lakes, visit our blog at fishhawkelectronics.com.